So Father, today we hum humbly come before you to thanking you for the truths of your word. And I pray today that our time would be spent in a manner that would be profitable, not only in our individual lives, but for the greater kingdom of God. So encourage us today as we look into your word. We're mindful that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords and that you love us unconditionally. And we're grateful for that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So today, John chapter 5, which is where we left last week with John 4, the woman at the well. And then today we're in chapter 5, but we're going to combine two chapters, John 5 and John 9. And I think you're going to see in a moment. But before I do that, I found a little peanuts thing I wanted to show you. <laughs> Tell me what love is, Chuck. And he said, a man called Jesus. And that's a pretty good definition, I think. And yesterday, as I was playing with some guys, I told them about the billboard that I saw that took pictures of because some of them had a problem. And I want to just remind them that it's okay if you want to curse, just use your own name. And uh, don't, be, don't be using the God that one day you're going to stand before because he kind of takes that personally. So here's the deal. We're going to go to John 5. And you're going to have to listen fast as we kind of move through this. And then we'll come back and break it down. Now, does everybody have a handout? Uh, if you don't have a handout, raise your hand. Okay, one back here. There's one back there. We need one <clears throat> right there. But his ministry base in Capernaum. And that's where he met the woman at the well. Because he was cutting through and taking the shortest route, which the Jewish people never did. They would go completely out down the road from the north. They would take the Jordan Valley Road. And it added a lot of time. In fact, it was a three-day walk. And that's for those people who were in good shape. For us, it would take uh, quite a bit longer. But for me particularly. But having said that, they would go all the way down the Jordan Valley, turn, and then they would go up to Jerusalem. And so over and over again, when you read especially the Psalms and other passages of Scripture, it talks about going up to Jerusalem. And so that's why, because they were going up toward the city, the golden city of Jerusalem, etc., etc. Now, so now we find Jesus. He's back in his uh, ministry base there in Capernaum. And so after some time then, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. So anyway, time now we have Jesus sometime later going back up to Jerusalem for yet another feast. And now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda and which is surrounded by five colonnaded columns, or covered colon colonnades, as they say. And here a great number of disabled people used to lie. Now, I've just injected a couple of pictures here for you to show you, because if you were in Israel or you've been to Israel, this is the area. There are five different porticos and pools of water in this area. And, of course, today the water levels are much, much lower now than they were before, but it is quite an area that they've done a lot of excavation in that area and so forth. And once again, it just validates the fact that the Bible is always accurate and true. So in this area, this is where a lot of disabled people used to, to be brought to lie there. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him a very strange question. Do you want to get well? Hello? I mean, I've been here 38 years. But we'll talk about that question in a moment because it's very appropriate. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. And while I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. And on the day upon which this took place was the Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. Can you just imagine this man, 38 years, they come up with such a stupid statement. He's got to look at him and say, what planet are you people from? I mean, I've been laying here 38 years. I get healed. I don't care what day of the week it is. And, but he replied in verse 11, the man who made me well said to me, he's passing the buck here, okay? He's not taking any responsibility because, and you have to, you'll, catch, you'll catch this later, and some of you remember it from other previous teachings, the Jewish people, the, the leaders took names. And if you cross them, they put you out of the synagogue and the temple rather. And if they put you out of the temple, then they would not offer a sacrifice for you, which is the way that your sin was atoned for. So they had to play ball with the religious legal system in order that they didn't get, quote unquote, I'm going to use this phrase, excommunicated. Okay. So he replied, the man who made me well said to me, 
pick up your mat and walk. And so they ask him, well, who is this fella who told you to pick it up and walk? And the man who was healed had no idea who it was for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you're well. See, you're well again, I should say. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Remember that phrase. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. And so because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. And for this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his father, his own father, making himself, careful, listen carefully, making himself equal with God. Remember when we did our study through Genesis that the, the God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, the triune Godhead, always present from eternity past to eternity for, for the future. And so here Jesus is just making the statement, my Father and I are, are equal to God. And so Jesus gave this answer. Very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he does, yes, and he will show him even greater works than these so that you'll be amazed. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son, of, the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Verily, very truly I tell you, a time is coming and now has come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man." Do not be amazed at this, for time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not true." There is another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is true. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it, that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. I have testimony weightier than that of John, for the works that the Father has given me, he says, I go on to finish. He says, the works that I've finished and the very works that I'm doing testify that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice, nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one that sent me. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. I do not accept glory from human beings, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I've come in my Father's name and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe since you accept glory from another, but do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? But do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses on whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would believe me for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? So in John chapter 5, Jesus gives us a number of very important statements, which we're going to break down in just a moment, as you can see according to the outline, the notes I'm going to give you. But we're going to go ahead real fast and jump to John chapter 9. So take 5 and set it aside for just a moment. Now we're going to move over into John 9. And so the Bible says, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Well, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me, because night is coming and when no one can work. 
While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And after saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. And that word Siloam means scent. And so the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they asked. And he replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes, told me to go to Siloam and wash, and so I went and washed, and then I could see. Well, where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought, to the, they brought him to the Pharisees, the man who had been born blind. Now on the day which, which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees... <laughs> Also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened, the man replied, or your eyes he opened, rather. The man replied, He is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one who you say was born blind? How is it that he can now see? Well, we know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. Verse 22 says his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. And that was why his parents said, He's of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been born blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. And he replied, Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, Well, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I've told you already and you did not listen. Why? Do you want to hear it again? <clears throat> Do you want to become his disciples too? <laughs> then they heard insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciples. We're disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Well, that's remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody's ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, You're steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they'd thrown him out. When he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who are with, you heard him, or with him heard him say this and they asked, What, are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you'd not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. So, so we have 47 verses in chapter 5, 41 in chapter 9, total of 87 verses of Scripture. So now what I'm going to do is just share with you, and I'm going to do this on two tracks, okay? So on the one side, we're going to have John chapter 5, and on the other side, we're going to have John chapter 9. So I want to talk, first of all, about the place, okay? Because the place where these miracles occurred, and you should be aware of this, I'm sure most of you are already, but there are only two recorded miracles of Jesus in the city of Jerusalem, only two. And we're going to talk about both of those today. Now, why? Because the Jewish religious system stifled any genuine presence and power of a miracle-working God. And so here, the place, first of all, in verse 2 in John 5, is the Pool of Bethesda. And I showed you that a moment ago. But in John 9, the place is the Pool of Siloam. Now, the last number of years, this has been uh, uh, excavated heavily. So let me tell you a quick story. When Hezekiah was a king of Israel, and he was one of the, the 20 uh, kings of, uh, I mean, uh, one of the... Uh, 19 rather, the, but he was one of the few good kings of Israel. And they were about to be attacked by the Assyrians from the north. And so their water source in Jerusalem was the Gihon Spring. Now the problem was the Gihon Spring 
was just outside the city walls, which meant that the enemy could access their source of water. And so King Hezekiah had this great idea. They would start on the outside and they would dig, dig a, a tunnel to then divert the water flow and bring it into underneath the city walls and into the old city of Jerusalem. And so what they did was they went inside the city and there was a team that started digging a tunnel toward the exterior of the wall. On the outside, they put a team there that was digging toward the inside. And the goal was that eventually they would hope that they would somewhere meet, you know, reasonably uh, close, okay? But in the providence of God, they did just that. And so as they tunneled toward each other, they came to a point. Now, we're talking about rock. We're talking about pick and shovel and, you know, hauling the dirt out. And all. They came to a point now where they could actually hear, one side could hear the other side digging. So they knew they were very, very close. They finally broke through and met to allow the water then to come from outside. Then they went out and closed up the outside source so that they, it could not be seen or messed with. And now they had the water on the inside of the city. It was really a miraculous feat. And in my younger years, we used to take uh, uh, groups to the Holy Land and we would actually go through Hezekiah's tunnel because for most of the year, with the exception of just the summertime, you know, you've got water flowing in there. So we'd have water, you know, sometimes over our feet, up to our ankles, what have you. But more importantly, we had to really crouch down to get through. And I can't crawl like I could back in those days. And so we don't really do that anymore. But it's amazing feat to go through there because where they met, they put a plaque on the wall. And it talks about the date. And that's a historical fact. But you should go back to Kings and read this account in the scriptures. Uh, Chronicles also records it. But anyway, <laughs> that said, it was a marvelous feat. And so now what's happened is for many, many, many years, this area today is known as Silwan, which is an Arabic term, but they're doing great excavation there. And the intention is, well, they think they're about three to four years away if Jesus tarries. They are going to revitalize that whole area. The pool will be there once again. Now we know that the pool of Siloam, uh, because remember, for the Jewish people to take a religious bath called a mikvah, you have to have moving water, okay? Cannot have stagnant water. So we do know that because of the Gihon Spring coming into the Pool of Siloam, there was water movement there. And so we also know because of the number of staircases found around the Pool of Siloam, and these are just a few, there are about seven of them on different levels, that this area was used as a ritual bathing place in the time and ministry of Jesus' life. So number one, the place. But let's talk about the second thing very quickly. <clears throat> and I just hit that too fast, did I? Yeah, we're going to talk about number two is the persons. So let's talk about the lame man, 38 years he's been laying there. Now, can you just imagine, 38 years, every day, somebody takes this human being, carries them there, places them there. Somebody's got to bring food to him there. Somebody's got to come back in the late part of the day to collect him, to take him back wherever it is that he is staying. This is the ritual for 38 years. Now think about that for a moment. Long time. That is one tough life. And I've got to tell you, we, we have much to be grateful for because there are people today who have chronic issues and still suffer every single day. So we're grateful for every day. But anyway, he was lame. This was a continuous, ongoing. And here was the thing. At the pool of Bethesda, they believed that an angel would come. This was a myth, of course, that an angel would come periodically and stir the water. And the first person into the water was healed. Now, here's what's ironic. They don't have any record of any person ever being healed. But so Jesus comes along and he's having this conversation with him. And he tells him, there's no one to help me to get to the water to be healed. So now skip from John 5 then. Let's talk about the man born blind over in chapter 9, verse 1. So here he is. He's born blind. Now the man that's lame for 38 years, we don't know if that was a thing from birth or not. I do not think it was from birth, and I'll tell you why. When Jesus talks to him, he says, stop sinning or worse will happen to you. So I actually think that something had happened earlier on in his life that caused him to become lame. And that could be any number of things. But the bottom line is this blind man was born this way. And he, there was no, I mean, there was nothing he could do about that. 
He was blind. So when you're blind, you don't have a lot of options, okay? When you're born this way, you've got some real problems. And so number three, the problem is there wasn't anyone to help the lame man. And the problem for the blind man was there was no cure and all he could do was spend his entire life, in essence, <clears throat> just simply begging. So let's move to the fourth thing, and that is the prescription. And in verse 6, Jesus asked that staggering question, do you want to get well? <clears throat> now, I want you to think about that for a moment, because that's a very strange question to ask. But keep in mind who's asking the question. This is the God who knows the end from the beginning, who knows every intention of every person's heart, etc. And he knows exactly everything going on in the mind and the heart of this lame man. So if he were to heal him, guess what? There would be responsibility that would come. Okay? So now nobody's going to pick you up. Nobody's going to prepare your food. You're going to be on your own. It's up to you to take personal responsibility from this day forward to take care of yourself. Do you really want to go there? Look, there, there are people today in our own culture, we may even have some in our own families, who have simply just decided that they'd rather have everybody else take care of them than take care of themselves. And they just pass the book on responsibility. So having said all that, then his prescription was for the man in John at the Pool of Bethesda, do you want to get well? But, it, but the blind man, it was go wash your eyes. Okay? So what would have happened if Jesus had said, to the man born blind, after he mixed... Now, you remember, the man couldn't see him doing that. He's blind, right? Mm -hmm. He can't see Jesus spit on the ground and make some spittle with that. He only knows what when he, put, he feels it when he puts it on his eyes. Okay, so he assumes because it's a pasty thing, he can figure out that maybe that's what he did. But then Jesus says, go wash. Well, wait a minute. Why did he say that? Why didn't he just put the stuff on his eyes and say, you're healed? Because that's not the point. You see, it didn't take any faith to just simply have it done instantaneously. The step of faith was when he said, go wash your eyes. And when he did that, he exercised his faith that he could, in fact, be healed. Because the Lord could have healed him without sending him to the pool of Siloam. But he wanted him to, to, to take that responsibility to step out and say, you know, you say, go wash. I'm going to do it. Hey, I don't know if it's going to work or not, but I'm willing at this point in my life to try anything. You ever been there? You ever been so low that the only place you can look at is up? You know, been so down, you know, all I can do is look up and, know, and try to act by faith, and that's what this man did. So he goes and he washes. Now, going back now to John 5, number 5, the Pharisees, their big deal was this guy's healing people on the Sabbath. And, and i got to tell you, you know, in, in my many journeys to the Holy Land, I've dealt with and talked with lots and lots of, uh, you know, what I call modern-day Pharisees. And these are the guys that are, uh, they're wearing the long coats. They're still trying to keep the 600-plus uh, laws that they have and so forth. And they couldn't do 10. Now they can't, not doing very well with the rest of them as well. And, and they live their lives as though they're, they're in this system of legality and rules. And, uh, and it's really tragic. So the first thing that happens to them, what is their response? Hallelujah, praise God, this man, 38 years, he's walking, look at this. We rejoice in that. Give God the glory. Nope. It's the Sabbath day. You can't pick up your mat on the Sabbath day. You know, I, you know in all honesty, just in, in with my character and all, I'd have just wanted to slap them in love. Well, I don't even know if I'd have thrown the love in there. I'd just want to slap them. Can you just imagine 38 years and all of a sudden now I can pick up my mat and walk and some religious person says, you can't do that on the Sabbath day? What does he care what day it is? Man, he was, who was lame is now healed. And so they go to this, these laws, these rules and so forth. And you know, one of the things that I just came to my mind this moment was how many times the scripture tells us if a man's ox goes into a ditch, will he not pull him out on the Sabbath day? Of course. Why? If an ox is valuable, how much more valuable is a human being to these people? So over in, in John 9, the Pharisees, again, healing on the Sabbath day. Look in John 9. I'm going I'm to read this because it's uh, pretty interesting. And, and if you will, just notice that it's verses 13 through 16. But here's what he says. 
<clears throat> they brought to the, to the Pharisees a man who had been born blind. Now, the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath, and therefore the Pharisees asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. Do you think the guy that was blind and now could see could, cared about that? This, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. I can almost hear him saying, Who cares? But others asked, How can a sinner do such or miraculous things? And so they, they got into a kind of a quarrel between some of the Pharisees. Actually, said, oh, Wait a minute. A sinner couldn't do these kind of things. And so now there's some division among the Pharisaical leadership here about who, but finally they turned to the blind man and said, what do you have to say about this? It was your eyes that he opened. And he replied, he's a prophet. He's a prophet. So here's a guy, couldn't see from birth, and I'm going to make a statement here, never read anything because they didn't have Braille in those days, okay? And yet his comment was, he is a prophet. He's a prophet. He had heard somewhere in his lifetime that there was a Messiah that was going to come. He was going to be sent by God to bring peace into the world and to heal and so forth. So that man knew that much. And the bottom line is he knew more than the religious leaders of the day did. So number six, let's talk about the prophet. Right, and I put verses 16 through 47 there uh, in John because they deal extensively with uh, who Jesus does because Jesus talks about the fact that I am the light of the world. I'm always in the world. I'm doing the work of my Father and so forth. So I'm not going back all through that again with you. And then look over in John 9, the prophet, in, he says, he declares him to be the prophet there in verse 17. So then seventh and lastly, they bring the parents in. Okay? So they figure, well, we're going to talk to the parents because we're not really sure that this is the right guy. So they bring them in. And in John there were no parents in, in the issue with the lame man, at least not recorded in Scripture. But in John 9, they bring the parents in and they said, hey, they said, is this your son? Yes. Well, how was he? Well, we don't know that, but here's what we do know. One, he is our son. Two, he was born blind. Three, now he can see. And if you have any further questions, talk to him because he's old enough to answer for himself. Okay? So now that's a whirlwind journey through two chapters of John. Now, let's talk about some key takeaways real quick. And you might have to flip on the back of your page to write your notes if you want to write these down. But here are some things that just spoke to my heart as I studied through these passages. Number one, Jesus is compassionate and cares. And I'll tell you that we know throughout the ministry and life of Jesus, when he looked upon people, he was compassionate. For example, we're going to see next week that he's going to be feeding the 5,000. And they're going to be out there and they're going to be tired and they're going to be hungry. And Jesus is going to look at them with compassion. When the woman who had a bleeding for many, many years came and she touched the hem of his garment, out of compassion, she is healed. And, and so over and over and over again, we see the very character of God. So I want to ask this question. Do you think that God has changed? The Bible says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? He's compassionate. And so the next time that you feel down and out, and the next time that you're struggling a little bit, just remember, God cares for you. Jesus cares for you. There's not a single time, moment in your life, not, a, not one iota, that He doesn't care. Someone says from time to time, well, wh where's God in this? Well, he's, he's there, don't worry. And He cares. And he, he, He's promised what? I will never what? leave you nor forsake you. So he's not changing. And so if we feel kind of distant from the Lord, it may be because maybe we've moved because he hasn't gone anywhere. He's still in the same place. So don't forget the compassionate, caring nature of God. Number two, not everybody gets healed. Now, I'll never understand that. But, you know, there are people who pray to be healed and they're not healed. I've shared our miraculous story with my wife back in 2011 when she was diagnosed at MD Anderson with incurable and operable breast cancer and so forth, 100 days later it was gone. Now we, look at a, we looked at a PET scan, three bright yellow spots, cancer in the spine. Now nobody took a marks a lot and marked that on that PET scan graph. It was there. And then 100 days later it was gone. So do we have an answer for that? Only this, the mercy and grace of God. 
But there were times, and I've told you this, I would feel led to share a word about that in a church service I was preaching. And invariably, some well-meaning saint would come up after the service and say, well, that's a wonderful story about your wife. They, t- they probably just misdiagnosed her. Man alive. You want... That's the wrong thing to say to me. Because it's hard for me to, to be nice when somebody says, I want to look and say, are you just an idiot? You know, I mean, uh, seriously, MD Anderson, M, yeah, MD Anderson doesn't manufacture the PET scans. What's there is what's there. And so when it's not there, then it's not there. And they don't give God any credit that God can heal. And yet we do know that God heals. Now, bottom line is, not everybody gets healed. That's the way it is. Typically speaking, what I've discovered is, is that people who come up to me and make those kinds of comments, they're people who have either A, had issues and they were not healed, or they have a loved one who had issues and that loved one wasn't healed. And so they've kind of taken this, you know, not antagonistic, but a a skeptical position. Well, if God was going to heal somebody, then surely my son or my daughter or my husband or my wife, whatever, would have been healed. He would have healed them. And yet we know when we read the Scripture, just a cursory reading of Scripture tells us, for example, other than Jesus, who was the greatest person in the Old Testament? I mean, the New Testament. Apostle Paul, right? So what happened to Paul? Paul, three times he says, he asked the Lord to heal him. Why? Well, we know pretty much, and it's still just speculation, but for the most part, we think we have some pretty reasonable reason for this belief that Paul had an eyesight problem. Okay, he, because remember, he said, I've signed it with my own hand and blah, blah, blah. And of course, he had an amanuensis, which is what right, they would take down all the notes that Paul would uh, scribe, so to speak. And so the bottom line here is, is that God said to him on the third time, my grace is sufficient for you. Now, you know why that happens? Because God has the big picture. Okay. You see, 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that we're now looking as though through a dark glass. Okay? But in the end, when we're in the presence of the Lord, then we're going to see everything clearly. You see, we have limited vision now in this lifetime. But ultimately, when we're with Him, we will, it says, we'll know and we'll understand all things. Now, having said all that, so not everyone gets healed. And yet, is it okay to pray? That the, yeah, absolutely. But this is why we pray, Lord, if it is your will. You say, what's well, God's will that everybody be saved? Not true. Not, that, that is not true. Now, when I say saved, I should say, it is God's will that everybody be saved. It's not God's will that everybody gets healed. Because if that were the case, He would do it. But there's a bigger plan here that God sees that we don't necessarily are able in this lifetime to be able to see. So not everyone gets healed. Thirdly, religion equals rules. Now, once again, I want to be clear. God is not a fan of religion. God is not the initiator of religion. Religion is man's attempt to get standing before God by their own works. Amen. Get that? I want you to make sure you understand this. It's really important. God is not a fan of religion. It's, with God, it's all about relationship. Christ in you, giving yourself to Him. He comes to dwell within. And I want to tell you something. Bottom line, there's not a person within the sound of my voice who is able to keep the Ten Commandments. So we would strike out. There's no way we can do it. Enter Jesus to come and do for us what we could never do for ourselves. To give us something that that we could never ever lose. And that is eternal salvation. Being born again into God's forever family. And once we're in there, how many times have I said this to you? I'm going to continue to say it because I want to hammer this truth home. Romans 8, 38 through 39. I'm persuaded that neither life nor death nor powers nor principalities nor any other thing can ever separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. You cannot be separated from His love. You can be separated from His blessing by living a life of disobedience. But it doesn't change your position in Christ. If you have been born again, okay, And I say if because there is a counterfeit religion or salvation just like there is. Remember what 1 John 2, 19 says? They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been, no doubt they would have continued with us. The best evidence for all of us that we truly know Him is our desire to be pleasing to Him and just keeping on keeping on. That's what we do. Because we know that in the end, 
we know what our eternal destination is. And that's why Jesus said, hey, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again, receive you in myself, that where I am there you may be also, John 14. And so here we go. Religion is just a bunch of rules. So this is what you get with religion. You can't, it's not lawful for you to pick up your mat and walk on the Sabbath day. I mean, you know, when I was a kid growing up, <coughs> I was in a, in a great, great church and it had a great pastor. And under that ministry, uh, I think I've shared my story with you before, but at six years of age, I gave my life to Christ. And I didn't understand all that stuff, but Jesus loved me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And, and uh, God fortunately never changed his mind about me. But having said that, after that great pastor left and went to a church up in uh, the north, we had a guy come in and everything was about rules, okay? Okay, you can't have hair that touches your collar. You can't wear blue jeans. You can't, can't, it's all a bunch of can'ts. And, and you know, I, even as a young person, I began to realize, this, this don't sound like a loving God to me. It sounds like some dictator, you know? So years and years and years go by. Of course, obviously, God called me to ministry and I was 12 years old to preach and so forth. Through the years and so forth, I wandered around and so forth. And finally, God got my attention again. And I, I came back and renewed that call to, um, of the Lord in my life. And so as the years go by, then I get these invitations to preach. And so one day, Sandra and I get this phone call. And this guy said, is this Dr. Frazier? And I said, yes, sir. Well, my name is Dr. Dallas Billingsley. And I'm pastor of Riverview Baptist Church up in the Tacoma, Washington area up there. And I, I want you to come preach for us. But in order to do that, you've got to do three things. I said, okay. He said, you've got to wear a white shirt. I said, okay, I have white shirts. He said, he, he said you, you can't have hair on your collar. And I said, well, I can take care of that. My wife cuts my hair, so she can take care of that. And he said, and the third thing is, you got to preach from the King James Version of the Bible. I said, hey, I, I, listen, I, I'm like Paul. Uh, whatever I can do, I'll do to get the message out, okay? So it's okay. So sure enough, but when I hung up the phone, I thought, this is going to be a fun weekend. <laughs> so we get out there, and this, this guy, he walked around with a cane, and I'm telling you, you talk about a dictator in charge. This guy was a dictator. And so anyway, we had a great time. He decided then after the fact that they would uh, want to do a Holy Land trip through our ministry. And so they got a group together and so forth and so on. So it happened that Sandra and I were with, we had several groups in the land at the same time. And when we have multiple groups in there and very large groups, we always try to be there and so forth ourselves. And so we're there and we got, and this was back a few years ago with, when those kind of jumpsuit things were kind of popular. What do you, what do you call those? Yeah, jogging, warm -up. Jo uh, jogging suits, that's what it, warm up type suits, okay? So we come walking in the high readings of the hotel. We bopping in there at dinner time. We're coming in. We got our little jogging suits on. Sandra's got her. We, so we're, we're, we're coming down the dining room and there they sit. They're at this table, long table. All the women, dresses on. Men, all the same color slacks, port, sport, same color sport coats. And, and they were all sitting there like they're, you know, I'm waiting for somebody to say, at ease. <laughs> Nobody ever did. He's at the end of the table with his stick there. And I'm thinking, this guy thinks he's Moses, I guess. I don't know what the deal is. But anyway... Yeah, yeah, yeah. We come in and he looks and says, well, you two are awfully casual. Like, you know, hey, get over it, man. We, this is Holy Land. We're not going to church. So anyway, bottom line was, was that that's what you get with religion. Now, it's not that he wasn't a good guy, or, and, I, and I have no doubt that he was saved, but religion equals rules. For example, those, that same guy would say, they'd have church camp, and the boys could swim at one time, the girls swim another time. And never the two shall meet, you know. And, and I understand all that, but it's just a bunch of rules. And you, we can't keep the 10. What, what in the world are we going to do with number 11, 12, and onward, you know? So the bottom line is, I'm not, and by the way, if you don't buy, know by now, I'm not a religion guy, okay? It's all about relationships with me. So number four, God is always at work. He said, I have come to do the work of my father is always at work, and now I'm here to carry it on. 
Let me be clear. Jesus came to show us the Father. When you, that's why he said, when you see me, you what? You see him. For the Father and I are one. And the Jews went, the, I don't want to use the word Jews, the Pharisees went crazy. He is claiming that the Father in heaven, God, that they're one? I mean, they, they, could, they didn't know what to do with that. So what? The Bible said it sought, they sought to persecute him. And ultimately, they ended up doing just that. And he ended up being nailed to a cross because he permitted it, not because they were accomplishing their goal. Number five, there will be a resurrection. In chapter 5, verse 28, this is real important. Y'all still with me? Say amen. amen. It's been a long time, I know. But we're almost done. It's important that you understand that there are seven resurrections in the Bible. Okay? There are seven resurrections in the Bible. I wrote an article about this that was published in the Tim LaHaye Prophecy Study Bible a number of years ago. But the key thing that I want you to remember is this. It says here that at the resurrection, those who will be resurrected who have done good will be quote-unquote rewarded. Those who have done evil will be... You know. So what are we talking about here? What was Jesus referencing? Remember this. When Jesus came into the world, there was a place called Sheol. S-H-E-O-L. Sheol was the realm of the dead. In other words, when a person died, they went to Sheol. But now remember, Sheol had two compartments. It had Hades and it had Paradise. Okay? Now, when the resurrection of Jesus occurred, then Jesus emptied out Paradise. Everybody who had died and gone to Paradise was transported into Heaven. But in Hades, they stayed there. Now, if you want to get into this deeper, please go read Luke chapter 16, okay? Uh, because it's important that you understand, yes, in the Jewish mindset, there is going to be a resurrection. Who, the ones who do good get blessed. The ones who do evil, you know, persecuted or suffer, okay? Now, here's the thing. That is true, was true up until the resurrection of Jesus. But the resurrection of Jesus changed everything. That was a game changer. So because now we are in Christ, listen to this, there is no judgment ever for us. The body, Jesus, when he's on the cross, when he said, I, which means paid in full, no further demand ever to be made upon this account, that his death paid it all, period. In a discussion, we will never, that is those of us who trust him, will never be judged <laughs> with regard to our position. You with me? Regard to our position. Our position is we are in Christ because we have responded to His offer of salvation. We're in Him. Nothing can change that. Nothing can separate that. We will have a time of evaluation, and that's why Paul in the book of Corinthians talks about the Bema seat of judgment. But the word judgment there is, the problem is that word judgment. That's a bad translation. It, the Bema seat was to evaluate one's works as to whether or not they were done with a pure motive or an impure motive. Okay, now we've talked about this a little bit before, but let me be clear. If I stand up and I teach today, and you come up to me afterwards and you say, oh, Brother Gary, that was good, I enjoyed that, blah, 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 blah. Well, and I just, I just relish that. Then I'm doing this for the wrong reason. That's the wrong motive. Because the bottom line is, this is not about me. It's about Him. I'm just the messenger. Anybody can do what I'm doing. I'm just bringing a message. It's, it's, that's all there is to it. And I mean that. People come to me after church service and I say, you know, you just give me another rose to add to the bouquet which I'll give to Jesus when I walk out the door. And that's true. But those people who get up and they're in the limelight and their deal is they're singing because they want everybody to know how great they are, you know, and, and I'm not judging them. I'm just saying, I know that some do that. And I know some preachers, you know, I know that. I know lots and lots of preachers, trust me. So anyway, but the bottom line is, God knows the heart. And He knows why we do this. So do, do, we, do we give a word of encouragement to someone because we have compassion, because we care? God sees that and knows that our heart's right in that. Do we give uh, 
even a monetary gift or something because God spoke to our heart and we felt led to be a blessing to someone else, to be a channel of blessing to them. And so God knows. He kn- Listen, you can give all the money in the world you want to a church, but God knows what your intents and motives are. Because I can tell you right now, having been a Baptist pastor for a number of years, there are people who give money to the church because they're looking for cr- control with a capital C. They figure, I'm going to I'm, I'm buy my way into that deal. <laughs> that just doesn't work out real well. But that's the sad truth. That's just the reality of it all. So the bottom line here is we will never face uh, judgment, but there will be a, res- a day of resurrection. And for us, it happens prior to the tribulation. That's what 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18 is all about. When he says, the Lord himself shall, the sound of the trumpet, the Lord himself shall appear. And we, those of us who are alive will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord of the air. And those who are dead, they'll be raised first and so forth. So let me go real quick like and just wrap this up. We're done. So believers are never judged. But let me talk quickly about this kinds of sickness real fast because you need to understand this. There are three kinds of sickness in the scripture. First of all, Paul tells us there's a sickness unto chastisement over in 1 Corinthians. Remember what he said? Some of you are sick and have even died because you are not honoring the the Lord's table. In other words, they were coming there. They were making it some type of a feast. It wasn't what God intended because all of that was just to remind them of the life, burial, and death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. And so Paul talks about that. You can go read 1 Corinthians. um, 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 1 through 4. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 and following. Oh, there's several places. Third, Secondly, there's the, uh, the glorification of God. And Jesus makes it clear with the man in John 9 that he was born blind and healed un, in order to bring glory to God. And all healing, by the way, brings glory to God. And then there's a sickness unto death because Hebrews 9, 27 says, it is appointed unto man once to die. Look, bottom line is, if Jesus tarries, not any of us are getting out of here alive. That is in the flesh. And so, bottom line is, he might come today. If he is, I'm ready to go. He, he may, I may get to live, we may get to live, some of us, until the trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ are raised, and we get caught up in the air to meet him. That's okay with me too. But here's the thing. You never know. So what? Be ready all the time. Amen. Always know you're ready to meet him. Now, I'm done. I quit. I give. So anyway, uh, that's a lot of verses in a short period of time. Uh, But thank you so much for being attentive during that entire process.